ready. Okay, we're ready. Hi, welcome back. We are in the home stretch. How are you guys doing? Great. Good deal. So one speaker to go. A little bit of paperwork that we have to get through. And then you are on to your weekend. We, I want to just go over a couple of things. I want to wholeheartedly say, I know they're out there, most of them, but Again, led by Olga, all of the people here locally as volunteers have just helped make this, they plan this day and help make this what we feel like is a great success. So thanks to all of you here. We also couldn't do this without the sponsors and underwriters to help us with the cost of doing this. So we really appreciate that you stopped by all of their tables. Thanks for all of their support. Um, one thing, we did bring a stack of these. We, we hope that you absolutely now know how important it is that we need more people to speak on behalf of Alzheimer's. And uh, one of the great things about this postcard is that we have many more. You want to take them back. Ultimately, if you saw what will happen with these, we'll mail them to our senators. And the bigger the stack that we mail in, the more they pay attention. So that's ultimately what will happen with these postcards. Um, the other thing is there is a sticker on the top, and we hope that you will keep that, put it on, and wear it for the rest of the day. And it says one voice against Alzheimer's. And we need that very much. I also, I'm not sure if we pointed out, but the national color recognizing um, and bringing awareness for Alzheimer's disease is dark purple. We, need, we want dark purple around just as much as that other beautiful pink color is because we, I'm pretty sure we all know what that represents. We need to have that everywhere for Alzheimer's disease for sure. Um, again, if you want some more of these and you want to collect them, you can then get them to our office. I brought some business cards on our table, so if you need anything from the San Antonio office and chapter of the Alzheimer's Association, please grab one of our cards for sure. Um, two things in your packet. I'm going to leave, for any of you in the room who are getting CEs, I'm going to leave all of that specific, all those specific instructions to Joe because he is... He's the one who's doing all that, and he's the expert. Two things that we are asking for you to turn in, if you will, please, for the Alzheimer's Association in your packet. There was an education, education sign-in sheet. I know you must feel like you've already signed on a million things today. The reason that we have that, and we do use that all across the country for individuals who come to any of our classes, and the reason why is because, again, we go after donors. We don't have any federal funding that supports what we do. We go after grants. We do fundraising events. And our donors wholeheartedly want to know who we serve. And so that's why it gets a little specific about asking demographics, etc. That one, completely up to you. If you want to fill it out for us, we greatly appreciate it, and we hope that you will. That one says education sign-in sheet at the top. The other one that is for the Alzheimer's Association, there is, it's completely confidential. There's nowhere to put your name on it. It's a front and back sheet, and it's a survey about today's conference. What you liked, what you think needs improvement, what you want in the future, what you felt was just right. Any of those kind of feedbacks, wholeheartedly, any of that feedback wholeheartedly helps us for the future. So thanks for those. And then at the end, after Dr. Pena, we will have uh, Joe who can go through all the CE paperwork and any of your questions related to that. Last but not least, before I introduce Dr. Pena, I want to wholeheartedly thank Mark and Joe from the Geriatric Education Center who has been a great partner in doing these conferences. Greatly appreciate your help. And Maxine, who I think has stepped out of the room, who is just has just been a fantastic uh, person who has, has done so much for this conference. So my thanks to my coworker, Maxine. And Dr. Pena. 
who comes to us from Laredo, Texas. We greatly appreciate that he is our um, last but not least speaker of the day on this topic. His interest in Alzheimer's disease, like many of us, arose out of a personal and family experiences from the day-to-day -day things that are encountered to his practice in family medicine. His postgraduate training in psychiatry was obtained at the Texas Institute of Mental Science and at Duke Peter Smith Hospital, Fort Worth, Texas, in family practice. So, Dr. Pena, thanks for traveling and being with us. Good to see you. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, let me, uh, first of all, uh, tell you that I'm impressed by the fact that at this hour, you're still here. <laughs> Generally, at the conference that I go to, by uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, everybody's gone. So I thank you for being here and hope that uh, whatever conversation that I have with you will be of some benefit. I'm a family practitioner at this time. Uh, years back, I would deliver, say, for example, 20 or 30 babies a month. I gave that up. <laughs> Now, I treat mainly geriatric people. This is quite interesting. It seems like a career, it seems to follow a pattern. You, you start by doing all kinds of things. And sooner or later, it comes to you that perhaps you have found a niche in which you can work. One of the things I do, besides my practice, I have a, uh, a center for the elderly. It's called My Golden Years. And believe it or not, in that center, if nothing else, we exercise at least 30 minutes a day. We promote healthy foods. And we promote intellectual exchange. If nothing else, by playing Loteria. <laughs> that keeps you going. That keeps your interest. That arouses your memory. El burro. Wait a minute, that's not part of it. <laughs> that, that's not part of the loteria. Anyway, they know where to place the little uh, card or whatever, the little, uh, you know, uh, stone or whatever they use, or a button or whatever to, to mark the card. They know exactly <laughs> the name of the individual, El Borracho, they always know that, <laughs> right? La Muerte. And the funny thing about this is that they remember, because that is part of their culture. La Loteria is part of the culture. We don't play bingo over there because they don't understand bingo. Although it would be very useful, certain numbers would be very useful, it would help them to to get back to mathematics, simple mathematics, you know. But uh, we use something that is culturally relevant to our folks over there. And we converse with them. And we ask them to watch television. Novelas, for example. You watch novelas here? Yeah. Anybody watch the novelas? Oh, yeah. How about the one that uh, Lo que la vida, lo que la muerte me robó, algo así. <laughs> what is happening to Alejandro? <laughs> what a conniving mother-in-law, my goodness. Anyway, all those things promote intellectual exchange. And to me, that is the most important thing you can do for elderly people. Exercise, good eating, and intellectual exchange. My talk today I wasn't sure exactly what to emphasize, so I said, you know what, let's talk about this so-called window of opportunity. All of us know that uh, before you develop a full-fledged Alzheimer's condition, there's about 10 to 15 years that go by. Would you believe that? 10 to 15 years. We call this, in medicine, the pre-critical stage. 10 to 15 years go by and nobody notices anything. It is surprising to find out that most, that 20% of 
of patients with Alzheimer's disease never get diagnosed. Never. It is interesting to know, for example, that a person with Alzheimer's usually takes about two years before they decide to go see a doctor. And then it takes another year, perhaps two years more, to get an accurate diagnosis because dementia is not that simple to diagnose. Not everything is Alzheimer's dementia, no. 60% of it is Alzheimer's dementia, but there are other forms of dementia. Mi compadre, for example, has been drinking for years. He's got a different kind of dementia. It's hepatic encephalopathy. Yeah? There's a... But let's get back to the, uh, to the slides so we can make some sense of what I'm, what I'm doing and what I'm saying. Uh, okay, so... We all know that there's a bunch of people in the United States with Alzheimer's. Five to six billion, for sure. And by the year 2050, we expect that to at least double or triple. I won't be here, but some of you will be here. It is interesting that by age 65, a good, at least two to three percent of the people can develop Alzheimer's. By age 85, my goodness, almost 30 percent. I'm sure you've heard this in, in prior lectures this morning, right? Okay, if you have a relative who is, who has Alzheimer's, who's affected by Alzheimer's, you have a, another 10 to 30% chance of inheriting the disease. And that's where my interest lies. My brother, at age 85, developed full-fledged Alzheimer's disease. And before that, he was a brilliant man. I wish I could have brought you some of the poetry that he wrote, some of the philosophy that he had expounded on at 75 at my, you know. And so that is that's where my interest lies. I mean, the other is the fact that, hell, I'm 79. So I'm getting there. And that is perhaps the origin of my interest in this field. There is, like I told you a little while ago, a window of opportunity. There is a 10 to 15 year hiatus during which we can do something about it. It is interesting that by age, say, 65, a good percentage of the people already have amyloid deposits. I'm sure you've heard of amyloid deposits, beta amyloid deposits. And some people, in fact, already have the famous plaques and tangles. My grandson and I were saying, well, how do you say tangles in Spanish? Tangles, tangles, they finally came up with the word ovillos. That's funny, isn't it? It's kind of a funny word, ovillos. Enredaderas, enredos. Tangles is what you see in la novelas, entanglement, right? But in the brain, in Alzheimer's disease, you see ovillos. They're present, interestingly, uh, by age 65 in a certain percentage. Of the people and perhaps even before that in the preclinical stage. <coughs> it is also very interesting that in certain uh, families, particularly in this people, uh, in this village in Colombia that's been the, the, the subject of a tremendous amount of study and interest, people there develop tangles and plaques and Alzheimer's by age 30. Do you believe that? By age 40, they show a full-fledged picture of a very advanced, demented state where they're fully cared for. You know what I mean by that? Total care patients by age 40. These people, what happens to these people is that they inherit <coughs> certain genes, specifically Presenilin gene 1 and gene 2, located in the 14th, 14th uh, chromosome. Alzheimer's people, the late Alzheimer's people, the people that you and I perhaps recognize uh, a lot easier, 
they inherit APOE4 gene or APO2 or APO3 in gene in chromosome 19. Are you familiar with all the stuff I'm talking about? Yes? The window of opportunity. This, are this, this is the window that I want you all as caretakers, as providers, whatever your job is, to look for. Forgetfulness. Loss of concentration. Forgetting names. That's happening to me right now, by the way. This is the early, these are the early signs, the very early signs. Where I think you and I should start looking at would be at the progressive, progressive symptoms. Memory loss. But I'm not talking about memory loss of where you left your keys a little while ago and you go back and you find them. No, no, no. I'm talking about leaving your keys and not knowing even how to get back to where they were. One of my patients told me, uh, you know, Doc, I'm so embarrassed, I left my mother-in-law at the mall. <laughs> well, you remember, now just go get her. Said, that was a month ago. <laughs> that was a month ago. Uh, that was intentional, I'm sure. <laughs> but when you start getting disoriented, not knowing where you are going, you lose your way, you're driving and you lose your way, you don't know where you're going. Even the GPS can help you. The GPS doesn't help me, so I don't know how to use it. No, I, I do know how to use it. I lost my way of coming here, by the way. <laughs> Difficulty speaking. Language deterioration, poor judgment. Those are the things that I think we should be looking for during that, quote, window of opportunity. Those are the things we should be looking at. When you get to the next stage, well, it's kind of late, isn't it? It's kind of late by that time. By that time, anybody can diagnose Alzheimer's. No need to tell you what this is all about. You, you know, I mean, it's easy, but doctors don't see it. Don't see the first signs we, we showed a little while ago. They don't see it. And God knows with the... Uh, EMRs, you don't even have time to look at that. You don't have time anymore. But in our EMR, we now have a section for memory. How's your memory? What did you do yesterday? And oftentimes, we will take time to do a simple drawing test. And by the way, I passed out some samples of a simple drawing test. Have you ever tried it? Anybody here over 65? Really? Anybody here over 70? Nobody? Oh, beautiful. She is. <laughs> I want you to do this, and you'll give me the answer a little bit later. Get that, you have that, that the picture there? Yeah? The draw clock test. Okay, the first thing I want you to do is to draw right down with the 12 o'clock is 12 o'clock or should be 6 o'clock. Anybody else doing it? The young people can do it too. Don't be ashamed. 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock. That's easy. So far, you got it right. Now, put your manecillas, in other words, your... Don't see it in English. Hands. Hands? Minute, hand, and hour. Hand. Your hour. The hour. Okay. Put them to uh, show 10 minutes after 11. The hands of the clock. The manecillas, right? Yeah. Did you get it right? I can't see that. 
Yeah, he got it right. He got it right. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, this is such a simple. Anybody else try? Anybody try? You get it right? Okay. Very good. This is such a simple test. If you get it right, you get a score of one, and that's it. There's no need to uh, mess around with whether the numbers are in the wrong place. No, 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 no. Obviously, if your numbers are in the wrong place, you're not going to be able to do the. Uh, uh, 10 minutes after it's up. No way you can do it. That is a very simple test for cognitive, for MCI actually, for early cognitive uh, dysfunction. First of all, you don't remember the numbers. Memory, you don't know where they're supposed to be, spatial relationships. And then you can't analyze how to get 1110. Because 10 is not there, the 10 is not there. The 11 is there, you can more or less figure out where the little hour hand should be. But the 10, you've got to remember that there's a two, there's a one and a two. Such a simple test and very useful in detecting, believe it or not, MCI. Mild cognitive impairment. Very simple. I do it all the time. It only takes a minute to do it. As a test of, of function in an early person at 65 or over. Okay, let's go with the next. You know, this is interesting. The Alzheimer Association in Manchester, Chester, England uh, did a project where he, they tried to correlate deafness with Alzheimer's disease. Deafness, of course, can have an organic origin, but in people that had deafness and also scored poorly on neuroscientific, in other words, on, on mental tests, there was a correlation. People that are increasingly deaf may be candidates for Alzheimer's disease, maybe developing Alzheimer's disease. Isn't that interesting? Why? Well, we'll discuss a little bit later. The other avenue is olfactory loss. Some time back, La Universidad de Mexico did a study with uh, elderly people using familiar things, lemons, uh, whatever, stuff that would be familiar to their culture. And sure enough, they tested the olfactory loss of these individuals and they tested their ability, their cognitive ability, in other words, their cognition, their intelligence, their, their ability to function well. And sure enough, they found that there was a relationship between the loss of olfactory function in elderly people that were in the process of developing Alzheimer's. Isn't that something? I used to be a biology teacher, by the way, years back. And I remember I used to emphasize how important the olfactory bulb was for the earthworm. Remember that? Anybody remember from like your high school days, you had to dissect an earthworm, and the one thing that the biology teacher emphasized was the size of the olfactory bulb. Years later, some 40 years later, more than that, right? <laughs> it's come to me, I've come to realize that there is a relationship between our olfactory bulb, our nose, and development of memory loss. It's interesting, it's quite fascinating, right? because we now know those people that study pathways in the brain, that there is a pathway from the, especially the left nostril, to the hippocampus, the hippocampus, where memory is stored, and the amygdala, where memory is also stored. There is a pathway. There is a definite pathway. And there's some theories that try to explain this. Uh, I remember attending a conference in Las Vegas recently and they talked about prions. 
Prions are not viruses, not bacteria. They're other little, <laughs> little doohickeys that invade the brain. Protein molecules, polypeptides that accidentally get into your nose. And in fact, they can get into any one of the 12 cranial nerves because Alzheimer's can begin at any one of the 12 cranial nerves. And the pathway that they follow will determine the kind of Alzheimer's symptoms that you will show. But it's interesting to know that if you, if that prion, and this is just a theory, by the way, they're thinking, they're working on this very hard, very hard, is the, that, that prion could be the beginning of Alzheimer's disease because it affects the hippocampus and the amygdala. Interesting, isn't it? Never heard of that? I bet you never have. Because that is really uh, state-of-the-art information. The theory that Alzheimer's disease can go in by any one of the 12 cranial nerves and ultimately form the famous plaques and ovillos angles that I mentioned earlier. Somehow, I don't know if I should get into this or not, but somehow this prion breaks the beta amyloid polypeptide. We have that in our brain. It's part of our structure. Nothing we can do about it. It's there. It starts with what is called as APP which is the protein precursor of the beta amyloid. The beta amyloid then breaks up and it becomes a, what is called toxic amyloid B42. Why 42? Why 41? I don't know, but that's the way they call it 42. Anyway, that becomes very toxic to the neurons and their neurons start to break apart. As the neurons break apart, obviously the circuits break apart. Then there's another protein called a tau protein, but there's a tremendous amount of research now ongoing regarding the tau protein. Did you hear about this in the lecture, the lecture today? Or this? No, the tau protein, tau. There's people that are nothing but studying tau, the tau theory of Alzheimer's disease. In combination, the tau protein and the beta amyloid 42 eventually destroy the brain. And in, in the area of research, a tremendous amount of interest is, is ongoing right now in how to stop that process. How do you stop the amyloid 42 from becoming a toxic? How do you stop the tau protein from destroying all the neurofibrils uh, inside the, uh, the cell. I'm sure you remember the, the nucleus, the cytoplasm, and all this sort of thing from your biology courses. Where there's a lot of little, bunch of little tubules inside a cell. They're called tubules. But it is through there that messenger RNA and a bunch of proteins go that make the cell function. If you destroy the tubules, obviously, the cell dies. And it is quite interesting to know that at this time, wow, there's a tremendous amount of interest and research going in how to stop the fracture of this protein. We now know, for example, that there are certain specific enzymes, enzyme beta, enzyme gamma, which have to do with the specific breakdown of this protein. And by God, they're developing chemicals, substances that will block the breakdown of amyloid and therefore, in the process, stop the progress of Alzheimer's disease. Recently, I went to this uh, place in, outside of San Antonio, it's called the Center for Longevity Studies. And they emphasized that. Wow, it was fascinating to see rats that were infected with Alzheimer's disease. Rats that were normal compared their, their ability to do a certain maze, you know, complete certain mazes. There was quite a difference. And when you gave the infected rats with Alzheimer's disease, if you, when you gave them these compounds, 
Would you believe their behavior improved? Which means that if a rat can improve on this medication, so can we. As a matter of fact, one of the things that fascinated me from that visit was that they were working on a, on a medication called uh, Raumacin, Raumacin. It is a medication which is basically used to, uh, to uh, keep uh, a kidney rejection. It is used for that. They give it to people that have kidney transplants, you know, and they give it so they will, they will uh, stop the rejection process. It's an anti-inflammatory process because basically when you reject something, it's, it's based on inflammation, inflammation. Our own body produces antibodies that will cause the damage to occur, right? Well, this medication, believe it or not, has been given to Alzheimer's people. People with Alzheimer's. Right now there's an ongoing project they are actually giving it to human beings there. I asked them how much? What's the dose? Where do you get it? I actually signed up. <laughs> anyway, it's amazing what is being what is happening right now in the field of research. The unfortunate thing is, and this is, if, if there's nothing else remember from my lecture today, that this window opportunity seems to pass us by. It is very much like obesity. We just don't care whether we are overweight or not. It is part of our Americana picture, you know that. I don't know where we rank in Texas in obesity, but we're up there. I think Georgia is, is worse than we are, right? Something like that. Don't let it pass by. The message is don't let our understanding and our involvement with Alzheimer's symptoms and signs and the people that have it, don't let that pass you by. Get involved. Get involved. Let's quickly look at a portrait of AD as Alzheimer's saw it back in 1901. This is very simple. Augusta, 51 years old. Suspicious of her husband, believe people were out to murder her. What is your name? Augusta. What is your husband's name? Augusta. Your husband? Oh, my husband? She looks as if she did not understand the, the question. She's shown different objects. She does not remember, after a short while, which objects have been shown to her. This is, of course, a portrait of advanced events. Everybody knows it. It's so simple. It, is, uh, it was with uh, individuals like this that Alzheimer's himself Later on, uh, cut some slices to the brain, you know, get the usual picture and tissue stuff, and found the tangles. That was in 1901, more or less. How many of you have seen this movie? Don't cry now. <laughs> I want you to see just a little clip of that movie because... Uh, it, it uh, gives you a picture of the kind of individual that you and I will be treating, actually. Well, I treat the advanced also, but, but this really breaks your heart. This is what you call moderate dementia. If you are familiar with the... Uh, I think I gave you a scale there called the uh, advanced GABA scale for Alzheimer's disease. This would be about a stage five. It's, it's called the GABA, Alzheimer's staging. That would be about a stage five or six. Not a, not a, a seven or, you know. This person can still bathe herself, she can still take care of herself, and she still shows interest in things around her. But unfortunately, her main, the main component of her dementia is memory loss and not been able to connect past with present. Not being able to recognize people. Not being able to recognize names. She couldn't, as you, you remember, she would not recognize her family. She certainly did not recognize her husband anymore, except at one point where she does say, you must be Noah. And at that point, it's okay to cry. <laughs> Love 
mujeres pueden llorar, los hombres no. I have no one special. Just a common man with common thoughts. I've led a common life. There are no monuments dedicated to me, and my name will soon be forgotten. But in one respect, I've succeeded as gloriously as anyone who ever lived. Feeling good, dude? Feeling good. Big day today. You say that every day, you old devil. Hello? Hello? This is Duke. He's come to read to you.
stop crying. <laughs> Alzheimer's uh, usually takes about anywhere from six to ten years before you succumb. Uh, usually, the reason you die is not so much because of the Alzheimer's disease, it's usually because of other uh, components, your heart, your kidneys, or whatever. Um, um, and Let's face it, the brain does control our heart. If Alzheimer's hits a vagus nerve, what do you think is going to happen, right? It isn't just a memory problem. It is the fact that the brain does control bodily functions, and ultimately, you simply die. Uh, okay. I don't have to remind you of this. I think that uh, you recognize all of this, the memory loss. the lack of being able to make a connection, etc. Okay, uh, any comments about the movie? <laughs> Did you like it? How many of you had seen it before? Oh, come on. But it was, it's always fun to see it again, and again, and again. It makes me cry, too. Uh, let's go on to something which is perhaps maybe a little boring. First of all, Dementia is no longer called dementia. The DSM-3 now has changed into a major neurocognitive disorder and includes Alzheimer's disease as a subtype. So from now on, we are prohibited from using the word dementia. And if you write dementia on your billing, you will get paid. Us doctors don't get paid. We, we have to, okay. The stages. I want you to emphasize for the sake of not boring you anymore, the preclinical stage. Let's go over that. This is as proposed by the National Institute of Aging and by the Alzheimer's Association. This is what they propose. Phase one, phase two, and phase three. Look at phase one, because that's where you and I can intervene. Phase one, the preclinical stage. In stage one, in, uh, in, in phase one, Stage one, uh, the person is totally asymptomatic. But if you test them for the presence of beta amyloid in the cerebral spine of the brain, it's going to be positive. It can be positive. And if you do a beta amyloid PET scan of the brain, it's going to be positive. But they don't have any symptoms. In stage two, you have now the presence of plaques and tangles. But it's still preclinical. Still preclinical. In stage three, besides all the biomarkers we talked about, now you have cognitive changes. Can't balance your checkbook. Uh, you forget things where they're supposed to be and you can't seem to find your way back to those things. See, that's the whole thing. Uh, that's where you and I can intervene. At that point, treatment definitely is possible. In fact, we were talking about exercise. There are a bunch of studies that show that if you exercise at least 150 minutes a week, you retard the onset of Alzheimer's maybe by five years. Even physically, you gain five years in physical endurance. There's a bunch of studies, I don't want to go into all of those, but uh, there's a bunch of studies that show this. Keep in mind that exercise, in whatever capacity you are working in, you've got to get those people to exercise. 150 minutes a day. I'm sorry, a week. That is what's recommended by the American Heart Association. 150 minutes a day will kill it. Especially if they have heart failure, right? What is minimum cognitive impairment? Well, first of all, at that point, you definitely have the beta marker, the plaques, the tangles, and you have executive functioning deficits. This, at this point, wow, what a problem. 
people come to my office and say, well, you know, we, we're looking at my Tia's uh, testament. Did she pass her belongings to her son, whatever? Why did she give it to her boyfriend? It happens. It happens. Uh, this is where doctors and psychiatrists get involved because you, it's difficult to, to determine many times just how bad executive function has become. But when there's poor judgment, when there's poor business dealings, when there's poor ability to handle simple tasks, paying the rent on time, paying your bills, and a bunch of things, to care for yourself, uh, taking your medications when you're supposed to, etc., then you know that uh, MCI is set in. Dementia, it's interesting. Psychiatrists are so, gosh, I can't figure this out. Why does it take them that long to define somebody with Alzheimer's? Well, because, as I told you before, there are many other causes of dementia. So, according to the American Psychiatric Association, you have to go through all of this. It cannot be a sudden event, no. It has to be a clear history of increasing cognitive deficits, either based on observation or on reliable secondary reports. The main thing is impairment in learning, short-term memory. What is the most simple test that you, I'm sure you've used it. You tell them, let's three words, apple, table, penny. You go to something else, like the clock drawing test, for example. You go back and you ask them, what were the three words I gave you? They don't remember them. They don't remember them. That's short-term memory loss. And that, by the way, is part of the testing here. If you, if you look at your, uh, uh, so the handouts that I gave you, in the uh, M, in the mini mental test, that's the one thing you test for, memory. Memory. What day is it? What year is it? In the six item test that we will that we'll refer to a little bit later, what do you ask? What year is it? Where are you? Things of that nature, right? And it's amazing how accurate you can be with a simple test like that. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to say, declare somebody incompetent, because that really is a problem. When you go to court, based on tests like this, no, you don't get anywhere. Testing can be very difficult. But in an office setting, like regular office setting, or a counselor, some of you are counselors, you can use something this simple, the clock drawing test, the uh, mini mental state exam. What is the other one? The six item. Uh, impairment test. Very simple test. Very simple test. But for the psychiatrist, you have to have all this in, in, uh, in place before you can de declare somebody to have Alzheimer's disease. You know what it costs to do a PET scan of the brain? About $3,000. So not everybody can afford $3,000 just to prove that you have a bunch of plates and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, does it make any difference anyway? Well, there's a, a, a group of nuns aging, I think their ages ran from uh, what, uh, 80 to 107? They agreed 
upon death to have their brains sliced, you might say, checked for tangles and stuff like that, and guess what? They were full of them. And yet, they function well in spite of the abundance of tangles and plagues. How do you explain that? On the basis of an active lifestyle. Isn't that something? So, so much for plagues and tangles, right? Come back. I'm sure you're interested in this. They didn't have husbands either. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. What's that? Oh, okay, that, yeah. So, the other thing, the corollary would be, if you want to avoid Alzheimer's, become a nun. <laughs> Join a monastery or something like that, right? You're right about that. You're right. Are you interested in knowing anything about the APO E4 gene? How many of you would like to be tested? Raise your hands. Anybody would like to be tested? To see if you carry the APOE4 gene? Well, there's no question that if you carry AP, APOE4 from your father and your mother, in other words, you carry both genes, you inherit both genes, your chances of getting Alzheimer's definitely increase almost 50%. Fortunately, uh, you only carry one. <laughs> your mother didn't have it. Your father had it, you inherit that. And it's a recessive gene anyway. It is not a dominant gene like the gene we talked about in, in the people from Colombia. Or the people that develop Alzheimer's before age 65 at 50 or whatever. You know. Okay. So you have a chance of... of and besides there's APO2, 3 and 4. So if you inherit APO4 and APO2, nothing happens, maybe, you know? So it's all a matter of genetics, you know, you remember that from, from your genetic class, your class in biology. What does it mean? Well, it's interesting. If you are negative for APOE4, and you're also negative for mild cognitive impairment, then by age 55 or 70, you only have a 5% chance of developing Alzheimer's. 71 or 77, 21%, 78 or older, 31%. But if you go down, if you're positive for the APO4, and you also have mild cognitive impairment, your chances go to 50% at uh, 78 or older. Isn't that something? But you know what? You don't want to do that. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. But that test is available. I think it only make your life miserable. You'd probably be going to the state of depression. Let's go over this real, real quick. How do I do this in my office? Frankly, I rely mostly on personal interview and observation. And not just one time. I keep having to come over and. And we talk, we talk, and talk, and my wife says, hey, you don't get paid for that. Okay. But we still do it. We just cheat on them and put a different diagnosis. <laughs> Review of secondary re uh, parties. There's always somebody that comes in with reports. They're behaving this way, doing this, and doing that. Okay, you rely on that. The main thing is emphasis on the loss of executive functioning. One of the things that I just didn't put there, I don't know why, is the fact that the review of past medical history is so important. Obesity leads to Alzheimer's, you know that. What is uh, obesity, how do, you, how do you define obesity? Well, body mass index of 30 or more, right? How do you find overweight? 25 to 29.9. So we've got to keep ourselves below 
35. Why does obesity, how does it relate to Alzheimer's? Well, that's a, that's a whole lecture on interleukin-6, CRP, C-reactive. In other words, inflammatory factors that eventually go to the brain and cause Alzheimer's to become an issue. Right? It's a whole story. Uh, heart retention, heart disease, depression. A bunch of these diseases, you've got to make sure you have them, you take them into consideration to, in the evaluation of the person with, uh, with Alzheimer's. And finally, I start using these tests. These tests are interesting. They're simple to administer. The Minnesota, I mean the Minimental test, the draw clock test, the uh, CIT test, the ferment test, they're easy to administer it together, they'll give you a very good idea of where they are. A very good idea. They're very reliable. Each test has its predictive value, they're extremely sensitive, and they are actually they're they are actually accepted by not only Alzheimer's Association, but psychiatrists, etc. Except that a neuroscientist uses more, uh, if you go to court, you better use some better tests than that. But this is a, an excellent, these are excellent screening devices. We talked about uh, exercise, one of these days, look at that, it's, it's a beautiful article on how exercise uh, uh, retards uh, Alzheimer's. In conclusion, you can see that Alzheimer's is an insidious progressive disease. If we in, intervene in the early stages, as caretakers, as doctors, or whatever your role is, that is the place to, to enter. To engage. Love. Respect. But in my case, get them to exercise. Get them to take their medications. Get them to take their meals correctly. Get them to engage in an intellectual exchange. And now I'm going to test you. Okay, number one. Ready? The principal risk factor in Alzheimer's disease is definitely age. True. Early Alzheimer's associated with a genetic uh, dominant gene. Definitely true. Late Alzheimer's, APOE4. Mini tests, uh, definitely a good tool for diagnosis of an office setting. Testing for APOE4 is available, but not really a reliable predictor. And so on and so forth. Don't forget the plaques, the tangles, the beta amyloids. We have gone a long way from just saying Alzheimer's is a behavior problem. There is a tremendous amount of science now. Testing. I could spend another hour talking to you about the vaccines that are being developed right now. The beta amyloid vaccines to stop the spread of the beta amyloid. There's a bunch of stuff that's being done right now to try to, in, to, to put a stop to this. One of the slides that you show later was that one of your goals was to live in a world without Alzheimer's, right? And that's what scientists are doing right now. Believe it or not, the door is not closed. We think of it as an irreversible disease, but believe it or not, there's people out there that are working very hard to make it reversible. Thank you for your attention. Show the plaque. Oh, sir, doctor. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Pena, this is a plaque.
that we want to present to you um, is a drawing uh, that was created by an all communication oh. And this is our small gift to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. In our center, in the center I mentioned to you, the, the uh, center for the elderly, we also do art. And we do pantomime. We do high prints. It's, it's so much fun. It's so much fun. Okay, uh, before we move on uh, with the final paperwork, let's do a quick drawing. Um, Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. We have. Uh, if, any, if you guys, I, there was a sign up, sign up little papers there at the front. We're doing the little giveaways from your Valley Healthcare. We have the little by clock at the cross, and so the cross is going to go to Donna Casey. <laughs> you can pick it up at the table afterwards, and then uh, the by clock will go to. Jody Serla. Oh. And you can stop by the table on the way out. Thank you guys very much. Y'all have a wonderful afternoon. I think we still got some, some more stuff. Jody, you owe me, man. You owe me big. Big. Checks in the mail, right? Okay. okay uh, raise your hand if you're uh, looking to get continuing education credits, CEUs, certificate of attendance, anything. Okay. Make sure that you turn in your statement of attendance, which is going to be uh, page number three at the front. We're going to fill that out to, uh, completely, and we'll take it up in the front. Please, please, please uh, drop off your participant profile. Again, it's a completely voluntary form. Uh, fill in as much as you need, uh, as much as uh, you're comfortable with, and we will greatly appreciate that. Uh, be sure to fill out the evaluation form and uh, the signing form uh, from the Alzheimer's Association. And if you'd like a copy of today's uh, video, the speakers, go ahead and fill out the CD, DVD form and bring it to the front. Also, all the food supplies are gonna go into the trash if you guys don't take it. I will dump it myself. So please go over there, take the sodas, take the cookies, take the tables, take your, no, just take that too. And, uh, if you have uh, any more questions, dealing with anything else, put them there. Uh, definitely uh, speak to any of the uh, committee members and we'll definitely help you out. Again, just thank you so much for coming, taking the time out. Thank you so much for all the speakers and all the committee members for all they've done. And have a, a great weekend and drive safely. Thank you very much.